Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rivera Sun. I am an author, the author of The Dandelion Insurrection and many other books and novels, and also a trainer uh, with Pache Ibene, which is a 30-year-old nonviolence organization that does trainings and organizing across the country and around the world. Today, we want to make sure that uh, everyone who is a bit concerned about what might happen during the upcoming US elections knows who's organizing, what's going on, what to be worried about, what to be excited about, and how you can take action in ways that are effective and relatively safe. So we're going to cover a lot in this next hour, and thank you for joining us. First off, I'm going to share my screen so that you can see uh, some of the slides. So the November surprise is something that has a lot of people quite worried right now. And it's a way of referring to the scenario of if Donald Trump loses the election and refuses to concede or leave office, what are we going to do? If he does this, it makes it actually a coup attempt if he refuses to give up power. So how do we take this seriously, but stay calm, stay focused, and stay strategic? First of all, you should know that there's going to be four phases of action and types of actions that we can do. First of all, there's things that we can do this week before the election happens. Second, there's things that we can do on election day. We can vote and we can do other things. Uh, third of all, immediately following the election, there's going to be things that we need to focus on doing to make sure every vote gets counted. And then lastly, from uh, mid-November all the way through to the inauguration, we need to make sure that there is no November surprise or if there is, then we're ready to counter it. You should also know that there's a whole ecosystem of groups organizing around this and Pache Bene is just one of them. Uh, but we have some great friends and allies who are working on this. There are new campaigns like Choose Democracy, Hold the Line, The Election Defenders, Protect the Results. There are longtime nonviolence organizations like us or the uh, East Point Peace Academy or Nonviolence International and Beautiful Trouble and so many more. There are labor groups uh, and worker alliances. There are groups that are more traditionally aligned with the Democratic Party, like Move On or Indivisible. And then there are also a handful of interesting groups that are actually mainly conservatives who share our concern that the way that these elections might unfold may be unfair, unjust, and downright unconstitutional. Let's look at Choose Democracy just to start, because this is one of the core organizations that has been raising the alarm that there may be a scenario in which Trump loses and refuses to leave office. And in this case, we want to be prepared to choose democracy. They're asking people to do four things. One, to vote. Uh, two, to uh, refuse to accept the results until all the votes are counted. To be willing to nonviolently take to the streets if a coup is attempted and be willing to shut this country down to protect the integrity of the democratic process and the integrity and the results of the vote. So they're asking people to sign the Choose Democracy pledge and ask other people to, to take some trainings and to connect with or form a local affinity group. This is a group between five and 12 people who you are willing to take action with. Here's why you should sign the Choose Democracy Pledge. Uh, not only is it great to connect with the whole movement of people who are working on this, but every person counts in this pledge. Uh, a few weeks ago, it was at 29,000 people who had pledged to do these four things. Now it's even more. And this can be used as a deterrent to show anyone who may be thinking of backing an attempted coup that it's a bad idea. A lot of us are ready to take a disciplined, organized, strategic, and impactful nonviolent action to prevent that from happening. So go to choosedemocracy.us and be sure to sign their pledge. So before the election, here's a few things that we can all do to help make this election clear and decisive and uh, not so confusing for everyone. 
first help people vote. Go vote yourself, of course, but help other people vote. And, you know, it really helps to have a landslide victory one way or the other, honestly, to cut down on the confusion in which murky things happen and, uh, you know, elections get stolen. So let's try to make it clear and decisive. Right now, we can help to alert others to the that there may be a coup attempt. Uh, Donald Trump has not made a clear statement that he will respect the results of the vote. And we need to make sure that we're ready to uphold our own constitution and our own democracy. One way to do this is to circulate the hold the line commitments, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. But form affinity groups and make a plan of action. It's better to be prepared and then not have to use a plan than need a plan and not have one when you need it. So remember that all through this, we want to again and again remind ourselves and others that this effort needs to be anchored in upholding the integrity of the elections and democracy. It's not really all about how much we dislike Trump or we want to vote for Biden or vice versa. It's really about um, making sure that we don't just slide down that slippery slope into authoritarianism and ignoring our own uh, process in how we select the next president. So those hold the line commitments follow a similar vein of being really clear about what we're asking for. These are pledges that you can circulate to police and military, to media groups, to public officials. And they basically say something similar to what you're seeing on the screen. They're a little different for each group, but they're pledges and commitments that these people can take to show that they are willing to uphold the results of the elections. They're willing to uh, uphold the rights of citizens to use their First Amendment right to speech and assembly, to petition for redress of grievances, um, and that they will not issue or follow unconstitutional or unlawful orders. It's a great way to start letting people know that there's something we're concerned about, and we want them to actually do their job um, and to uphold the Constitution. So other things we can do right now is nonprofits, especially if you work for one or you're, you have close association with one, you can mobilize your network, just like Pachi Bene is doing, just like um, another group I'm involved with is uh, Nonviolence News. We actually sent out a whole newsletter just on the very things we're talking about today. And you can do the same with the nonprofits you might be connected with. You can do it with your individual mailing list. Some of us have quite a few followers. Make sure you talk to your friends and your coworkers. You may be surprised, they may also be worrying about this and not knowing who to talk to about it. Reach out to your faith groups or do a personal networks inventory. Who are you connected with and how? So during the election, we can vote. That's pretty straightforward. But we can also join this great new group called Election Defenders, and they are training people to use active bystander trainings and nonviolent de escalation to be at the polls and present, ready to nonviolently counter any threats of intimidation that may be showing up at the polls. Everyone has a right to vote, and everyone has a right to do so without threat of intimidation. So uh, please check out their work and uh, see how you can be a part of this on election day. Other things we can do is insist that every vote be counted. This is a big deal. We need those votes to be counted. But we also want to urge patients that it's going to take more than 24 hours to count the votes, and that's okay. We don't want the media to make any uh, hasty announcements that might be unfactual or unfounded. We don't want our friends on social media to be doing that. We want to make sure that people know that every vote needs to be counted. And you know, if we can be calm, even while we're looking a the possibility of a coup attempt in the face, that's going to be a plus and a bonus. We don't need to be running around like Chicken Little. We can be clear, focused, calm, grounded, and realistic about some of the scenarios that we're concerned may be happening. 
immediately following election day. It's great, again, keep reminding people it's going to take more than 24 hours to count those votes. Insist that all of those votes be counted. If you're going to use direct action, you may uh, want to look at your local election board and see if they need a little pressure to really do their job and really count those votes. We also need to make sure the media, again, is not calling these elections too soon or too early. We want to make sure that they are willing to say we don't know the results yet and it's going to take some time. We need to be part of countering misinformation wherever we see it. And if you want to take immediate action, protect the results is organizing November 4th demonstrations and a few other days of actions uh, to really amplify the message of count those votes. So let's talk about the, the big worry that's on people's minds. What if Trump actually loses the election and refuses to leave office? Here's a few things that we, we're hoping you do. And this message is coming from all of the groups that we've talked about already. Choose Democracy, Hold the Line, Election Defenders. We're sharing this message together. We want you to mobilize that affinity group and use nonviolent action. We'll talk about more, more about the specifics of how and what uh, in a minute. We want you to, again, keep anchoring and upholding the integrity of the elections, upholding the integrity of our democracy. It's not just being against Trump. It's about far more than that that's at stake. We want you to use nonviolent action to limit those who want to support any attempted coup. And we want you to help pressure groups to publicly, not silently, but publicly withdraw their support and denounce any coup attempt. Uh, this is very important. Silence is complicity, and we need people to not be silent about this if, if and when it becomes clear that a coup attempt may be in the works. So we also want you to reach out to others to ask them to join the mass actions, especially if things like general strikes, boycotts, and worker strikes are called for, then we're going to need all hands on decks to make sure that people know about that and know how to join in. So for our campaign nonviolence, Pachi, Beni, and nonviolent cities uh, listeners who are part of our particular network, we have a couple of requests from Pachi Ibeni to you. We'd love it if you could leverage your connections. Many of you have made great contacts with city officials, county officials, faith groups, um, different networks in your communities. We want you to please use those to start to raise the alert on this uh, subject that we're talking about today. You can circulate those hold the line commitments, uh, train in nonviolent de-escalation with the election defenders, with nonviolent peace force, with meta peace teams, uh, or DC peace teams is doing a lot of training. If you don't have a local peace team, maybe now is a great time to think about building one. Um, and irregardless of that, please, do focus on making sure as many people in your community know how to use nonviolent de-escalation. Form those affinity groups and start making a plan of action. Prepare to spread the word for mass action. Um, you know, there are things we can do to prepare for action that can happen now. Making banners, for example, can happen now. We don't have to wait till the day of. We can plan to have casserole lazos, pots and pans banging protests with our neighbors and neighborhood. It's so much better to have a plan and call it off than it is to try to mobilize a plan very rapidly in an emergency. And of course, these are just some suggestions. We're sure that you'll have more ideas. If you would like some help and assistance in thinking about those um, actions and how to make them strong, effective, and safe, Ken Budigan and I from Pachi Beni are going to be holding uh, nonviolent action labs on Thursday nights at 7.30 Eastern time. And you're all welcome to participate in those. So let's take a moment now, let's take a deep breath. And let's talk about the theory of how nonviolent action can work to counter a coup attempt. This is called an anti-coup. So we're going to use this word coup a lot in the next section. And I want you to just remember that this is a, a potential, a scenario. We don't know that it's going to happen, but we just wanna be prepared in case it does. 
So first of all, we have to look at uh, the pillars of support theories and model of power and struggle. So this comes from Gene Sharp, and he posited that power holders like a dictator don't actually have power just magically. They have power and the ability to make things happen because lots of different kinds of resources and people cooperate with their plans and agendas. And if actually people don't cooperate and those resources are not made available to the power holder or the dictator or tempted dictator, then actually it's just a little guy in a room throwing a temper tantrum. So, when we look at the types of resources that these power holders need, they need things like materials, the nuts and bolts of getting their orders carried out. Uh, things like money are also a material resource. But then they also need lots of human resources. They need the people to deliver the material resources. They also need skills and knowledge. These are um, you know, bits of information without which the the power grabber or power holder can't actually know who, what, where, when, why, and how to get things done. Authority is another source of power. And you know, authority is such an important one. We're gonna circle back to this and talk about that a little more. Sanctions are things like police or military, groups of people who can repress anyone who stands up to oppose them. And we want to make sure that any attempted coup does not have the loyalty, obedience, and access to those uh, groups of sanction wielders. Then lastly, there are things like intangible factors. And this could be a lot of different things, but fear is often a big one. Our willingness to resist or lack thereof is another one. Our willingness to obey the orders of the person who's trying to take power is a huge aspect of this. But um, these material, these resources are delivered to the power grabber or power holder by lots of different groups of people, media, government, students, businesses, faith groups, public figures, workers, uh, bankers, police and military we spoke about. We could go on. There's a lot more of these. But for that reason, we can also think of them as the pillars themselves. These are the people propping up the dictator or the power holder or not in the case that we'll talk about in a minute. So let's look at um, our November surprise. So if Donald Trump loses this upcoming election and refuses to leave office, he is in effect trying to pull a coup. He does not have the right to continue holding office and he needs to leave. In this scenario, it's not enough for him just to have the support of his Trump supporters. This is a very shaky and untenable position that he doesn't have a firm ground to stand on if uh, he doesn't shore up his Trump supporters with other kinds of supporters. So some of the politicians will need to back him. Some of the media will need to back him. And honestly, you know, we know that certain media outlets already probably are in his camp and would love to back him and others not so much. So we wanna make sure that as many media sources as possible don't just declare that he should be the new president if he's actually lost the election. And then businesses are another really important pillar. And here's why. Businesses have a very powerful role in US politics and they are very crucial and critical to making sure that any of our politicians supports or doesn't support, ideally doesn't support a attempted power grab. The businesses are the ones who often make very large donations to these politicians' campaigns, so they often get listened to, and we want to make sure that message they're delivering is don't support the coup attempt, don't continue with this coup attempt. But Trump is going to need more than that if he wants to pull off a coup attempt. He's also going to need to broaden into all the other sectors that we've been talking about. And I want to just speak briefly about the 2000 election and return to that pillar of authority. Remember, we talked about that. For in anti-coup defense, one of the most important things to deny an attempted coupist is authority and legitimacy. 
So we've actually crossed some of the scenarios we're facing today, 20 years ago during the 2000 election. This was very memorable for me. I was a you know young 18 year old. It was my first election. I was so excited to vote. Um, and I think many of you will remember how that went down that actually uh, Dur Dur uh, Jeb, uh, sorry, George W. Bush is, it's hard to keep all those Bushes straight. There's a lot of them in politics. <laughs> but George W. Bush's um, family member in Florida, the, who was the governor at the time, and he actually stopped the Florida vote count before all the votes got counted. Right, and this became a crisis, and it got kicked up to the Supreme Court. So, who actually gave uh, George W. Bush the authority to be the president of the United States? The Supreme Court. After the Supreme Court ruled, maybe you'll remember who was very quickly conceded and gave authority and legitimacy to George W. Bush: the Democrats and Al Gore. Then the media got on their bullhorns and they started saying George W. Bush is the new president of the United States. And then we, the people, went along with it. At any point of that domino effect, if any one of those groups had said, wait a minute, this isn't fair, this isn't right, why didn't we just count all those votes? Maybe we should just pause, take a deep breath and keep counting votes then we might have ended up with a very different result to that election. In our current scenario, there are a lot of things that we can do with nonviolent action to stop, block, erode, and undermine these pillars of support and make sure they don't support an attempted coup. We can use acts of protest, uh, demonstrations, rallies, or just other kinds of dispersed actions to make sure religious groups and NGOs or nonprofits loud and clear denounce what's happening, removing the, the support of their silence from any attempted coup. We can also uh, encourage students and educators to go on strike. This is probably going to happen if, it, if a coup is attempted. Workers will likely go on strike and we can support them in many ways, including with a consumer boycott. Um, this is very powerful. We did talk about how this puts pressure on rich people and businesses to back out of supporting a coup if they're tempted or to be loud and clear in denouncing it. We can also erode pillars of media and politicians with acts of protest and persuasion and other kinds of direct actions. And as we start to uh, interrupt more and more of these pillars, this position uh, of an attempted coup is not so sturdy. And actually the more we interrupt the flow of those resources going to an attempted coup, uh, the worse their position is gonna be and eventually it will collapse. This is how anti-coup defense works. Let's see that again, because you know it's kind of actually encouraging. Here we go. So to dial it in just a little bit more, there's some key pillars we have to make sure we're focusing on. We've talked about the media a lot and it's really important. I think the 2000 election really showed us how important the media can be. We know it's gonna be critical to making sure that we don't declare too early uh, one way or the other. Uh, we also need them if in the scenario that Trump loses and refuses to leave office, we need them to denounce that. We need them to be really clear. So the politicians have a lot of things that they need to do. Um, we need to pressure them to make sure the Democrats do not concede unduly like hap as happened in 2000. We need to make sure Republicans are willing to stand up for the US Constitution's democracy, uh, the rule of law, the pro democratic process, the election results. We need to make sure there's no funny business with the Electoral College. And you know, I know the Electoral College has a lot of funny business that goes on, but we, we need to make sure that's at a minimum this year. Um, we also need to make sure that the military remains at least neutral on this and doesn't back an attempted coup. Uh, we need to make sure they stand up, uh, stand up for the election results or stand down altogether. Federal workers may have a very important role to play in completely non-cooperating with someone who is not the elected commander in chief. 
Uh, a strike by them would be very powerful in stopping and blocking that attempt. Um, businesses, we've talked about how we want to make sure we're pressuring the businesses to make sure that they don't find it economically advantageous to back an attempted coup. And again, we want to make sure groups, organizations, nonprofits, NGOs are uh, breaking silence and being really clear about what they stand for, uh, hopefully against a coup attempt. So anti-coup defense is different than any other kind of nonviolent struggle, uh, but it does share some common themes. And some of these common themes can be very powerful for us in understanding what we're doing and how it's going to work. First of all, while many of us as nonviolent activists might be used to singing to the choir, mobilizing with close friends, a anti-coup defense needs us to go beyond the choir, to go beyond our usual suspects, and actually start to talk to the center of our society. Not politically on the right, left of the side, but people who stand squarely in the heart and soul of our communities. People who may be mothers and fathers, parents, teachers, um, city council members, firefighters. We wanna make sure that those people feel welcome and included in actually standing up for our constitutional rights and standing up for our democracies. Alliance building, therefore, is going to be really powerful for us. Um, in 1920, in Germany, a guy named Wolfgang Kopp tried to actually pull a coup, right? And in this coup attempt, um, he said he was going to do it on Friday and start, you know, going into the office as the coupist on Monday. And the Communist Party and the Socialist Party uh, made an alliance. This was very unexpected of them at the time. And they went to the centrists of the politicians and said, if you will help us get rid of this coup attempt, we will back you taking power. So all three groups call for a general strike. And when Wolfgang Kopp went into the office on Monday morning, no, none of the federal workers were there. The country was in a general strike. Everything was shut down. So Kopp didn't even have a typist to type up his manifesto. I imagine him sitting there, you know, using the two-fingered chicken pack to try to plunk out his manifesto. And even when he had it typed, uh, he actually couldn't find somebody to print it. And then, you know, he couldn't find someone to distribute it. And within two days of this total non-cooperation, the coup attempt failed and the centrist took power. So alliance building can be really powerful. Nonviolent discipline is critically important, and here's why. We really want to try to avoid a scenario in which by rising up to denounce a coup attempt, uh, we run into violence in the streets and we lose discipline and then uh, give tr Trump an uh, his allies an excuse to declare martial law, to declare a state of emergency, and to crack down with heavy repression and seize power that way. Our nonviolent discipline will be very helpful in making sure that that dynamic plays out very, very differently. Um, it also will mean that we are doing our best to keep our actions open and accessible to as many people as possible. And lastly, the refusal to recognize illegitimate authority. We spoke about that pillar a lot. This is critically important, more so than in almost any other type of nonviolent campaign. Um, in Argentina in 1957, there was a whole series of coup attempts that had happened. But in this particular one, the people of Argentina were really sick of coup attempts. So they um, actually went to the army barracks en masse and the generals were overtaken trying to take power. So the people went to the soldiers and said, we need you to just stay put and refuse to obey the orders of these generals who are trying to take power. And you know what? It worked. They stopped that coup attempt. So this is the kind of thing that, that is very powerful to deny that anyone obedience who actually has illegitimate authority. So I want to make sure that we have tactics in our toolbox that um, 
are not our usual go-to methods. You know, in the United States, we are very used to using marches and demonstrations, mass rallies in public spaces. But right now we have three particular challenges to those kind of actions. First of all, we're in the middle of a pandemic still. Second of all, we know that alt-right violence has been on the rise. And if this happens, it's likely to increase. And thirdly, there is the grave concern over police brutality and police repression. So those are three very good reasons to think about how we can strategically and effectively empty the streets, quote unquote, rather than fill the streets. So let's look at a bunch of tactics that we can use. First of all, casserole lazos or pots and pans bang protests. Ironically, this is a picture from Colombia in a street demonstration where they're banging on their pots and pans. But um, Chile actually used a pots and pans demonstration where they emptied the streets and they banged their pots and pans from their apartment windows. This was very powerful for many reasons. It raised a racket all over the city um, or the major cities. And then it also was really hard for the police to stop. This was very important because people were being disappeared. People were being tortured uh, for rising up against the dictator Pinochet. And so um, this is a tactic that we could also use to great effect. We could put stand-ins in the street instead of our bodies. This is a climate action demonstration that happened recently in Turkey. And as you can see, it's very powerful, it's effective, and it's relatively safe. Overpass banners. So as you can see, this overpass banner in the Philippines has six people involved in it. That's a small pod. That's the size of your affinity group. And it's relatively safe compared to something like a mass street demonstration. And if you did this on a, a highway overpass, you could reach hundreds, if not thousands of people at rush hour. Bicycle protests are a tactic that's on the rise in the United States. This happened during the George Floyd protests. You can't quite see it in this picture, but there are 10,000 people participating in this. And this demonstration is four miles long. Isn't that incredible? Because of the nature of bicycles, it's fairly social distanced. Because it's moving, it's relatively hard for the police to catch and repress. Um, and yet they're covering a huge terrain, a larger terrain of uh, public demonstration even than a march could cover. So it's a great tactic. I hear these are already being planned for Seattle. Costumes could be used very powerfully. Now, this happens to be a, a demonstration in uh, a concentrated space. And remember, the difference between concentrated and dispersed actions is concentrated when, is when we put our bodies all in one space together, and dispersed is when we move our bodies out of one space. So we could use costumes in a dispersed fashion uh, and use photos and social media to really catch the eye and raise uh, awareness of the issue. Vigils could be used. You know, we forget how powerful public acts of mourning, of grief, of hope, of um, prayer, of vision, visioning together can be. We often use our go-to outrage and anger as the quality of our protests or demonstrations. But one thing about turning to this other spectrum of human emotion is that many of these are actually de-escalatory in nature, which can be really helpful if we think it's going to be a very contentious uh, time period. We want to pull down the likelihood of violence. We want to de-escalate it. Also, vigils can be done in small groups on every single street corner rather than having one mass rally in one place. Another dispersed tactic we could use is inverted flags. This is a universal symbol of distress. And honestly, if we are facing a real scenario where uh, Trump loses the election and refuses to leave off, 
uh, office, our nation is in a state of distress. Some of us might even remember when Bree Newsom climbed the flagpole at the South Carolina Capitol and took down the Confederate flag. Well, maybe we need to climb some flagpoles and put up an inverted uh, US flag. So we're gonna talk about worker strikes in a little bit, but we can also do lots of other types of actions that don't, if we can't take off work, and many for many of us, that's a challenge in our economic situation. We can also do things like lunch hour protests. We just take our sign, we leave work from lunch, uh, we leave work at lunch and we go and we demonstrate. This is happening in Hong Kong in 2019. Other uh, types of dispersed actions include street murals. These can be done with a relatively small group of people. They can be put in strategic locations. This one happens to be protesting Amazon's lack of uh, pandemic relief and care outside of Jeff Bezos's house. Um, and I do hear that a giant street mural is being planned for San Francisco just momentarily to when this recording was made. So this is already in the works and is a great tactic. If you don't have the tools and equipment for doing a giant street mural, consider just going getting a bucket of sidewalk chalk and doing sidewalk chalking in your neighborhood. That can also be powerful and even unexpected for passersby. Sculpture can be used very powerfully. This is not a real person in this cage. This is a sculpture. Um, and this is maybe the most powerful recent act of sculpture pro as protest. This was the sculptural protest that catalyzed national awareness about family separation. Very powerful. Other symbolic objects include shoes standing in for protesters, like the uh, student climate strike uh, groups recently did globally, or objects like chairs. This is 20,000 chairs, uh, which is representing 200,000 people who have died from our terrible mismanagement around national health policy uh, in the pandemic. Simply printing the truth can also be very impactful. And you know, writing op-eds about what's going on for your local paper might be a really powerful way to reach across political divides and across your usual lines of networks. Car caravans have been on the rise. Uh, we have seen a lot of these. So I'm just gonna share a few variations that can help us be even more effective with them. Car caravans can also drive slowly on the streets, stalling and slowing down traffic, just like a traffic jam. But in places where it's illegal to block the streets or to stop traffic, um, it's just simply going slow, maybe as legal as a traffic jam on during rush hour, right? And speaking of rush hour, another tactical uh, variation that comes from uh, pro-democracy struggles in Gambia is to pull over on the side of the road during rush hour and lay on your horn in a car honking, car horn honking protest. Very powerful, very loud, very noticeable. And since US is a very car um, heavy culture, it's probably something a lot of us can do. Now, blockades usually count as concentrated actions. And in fact, if you look at this photo, the um, people standing on top of the bridge are doing a concentrated action. They are blockading this bridge and keeping it from opening to allow a drilling rig to pass through to the ocean where it would go up to drill in the Arctic. The same thing is going on with these kayak activists down below. They are doing a concentrated action that blocks that drilling rig. But we can do variations of this that don't require concentration. So if you look at this banner drop, this is a giant banner that is actually a dispersed action. And the little black dots hanging from it are three protesters in climbing harnesses suspended from the bridge. Those alone would be enough to keep that bridge from opening and keep that drilling rig from passing. So blockades can be done in dispersed fashions, even though they are typically a concentrated action. 
So we already know that if a coup attempt actually happens, protest alone will not be enough to stop it. We're going to have to use acts of nonviolent non-cooperation and nonviolent intervention. And a school strike can be very powerful. And you know, our youth are very used to doing these at this point. Uh, rent strikes or suspension of payments can be very powerfully powerful economically. A go slow strike could be used if you can't go on a total strike, then you could work very slowly or work to rule. And if you don't, just to share a little story about how powerful this can be. In Denmark in the 1940s, the, during the Nazi occupation, the Nazis really wanted the Danish shipyards to build them more warships. So the Danish shipyard workers worked very slowly. They slowly turned in the bolts. And when the Nazis weren't looking, they slowly unturned the bolts. They might slowly walk across to the tool area to get a tool and maybe they'd pick up the wrong tool, meaning they'd have to walk slowly back to the tool area to get the right tool. They were so effective at this kind of uh, go slow strike that by the time the war ended, the Danish shipyard workers had not completed a single warship for the Nazi regime. Don't underestimate the snails. Another tactic that we can use is suspension of sports and social events. This recently happened for Black Lives Matter when the NBA uh, players um, went on strike. And what one thing this does, if we do this in many levels of our sports and social events um, organizing, is that it starts to reach people who might have been relatively inured from from other kinds of actions. So it can be a really great way to break through to, to that center of the country, to people who maybe aren't activists, quote unquote. Um, and it could be a really powerful symbolic way as well to say, why should business or life as usual continue when something so egregious is going on? On a similar vein, canceling holidays or in the US culture, maybe even more significant, canceling the sales days oh, associated with holidays. So um, in the timing of this one, Black Friday is coming up right in the window where Trump might just refuse to concede the election. And again, putting that pressure on the economic pillar, on the business pillar, could be very powerful for all of that wheeling and dealing we know goes on behind the scenes. Walkouts from work can be very powerful. This is when you just leave work in protest of what's going on. Boycotts uh, are a great tool that we don't use enough. And honestly, a shopping and consumer strike of anything non-essential um, would be very powerful in changing the game around this scenario that we're worried about. Worker strikes, as I mentioned, are already being planned. They're already in the works. And what we can do is be ready to join in, be ready to support them, and be ready to speak out in, in defense of them if they start getting critiqued. Flash strikes are like walkouts, they're rapid, quick flashes of strikes. You may do one uh, during rush hour in the morning at the coffee shop you might have to work at, um, or during rush hour in the evening. There are things you can do multiple times a day, and they often happen so quick that they're hard to um, retaliate against for um, people who may not want them to happen. Teach-ins. So typically we think of a teach-in as something that happens at a college university, like this one in the 1960s against the Vietnam War. But you know what? They can happen on Zoom too. So go to your regularly scheduled Zoom event, come off mute, interrupt whatever's supposed to happen, and start teaching in about what's going on in this country. That is a teach-in. By the way, those walkouts you can also do those on Zoom or online workspaces. Show up for a moment, tell people why you're leaving, and then get off the call. Industry strikes. So 
we often forget that it's not just workers who can organize, but it's also industries or independent businesses or business owners that can work together in their whole industry to coordinate an entire strike. And, you know, honestly, if an attempted coup isn't reason enough to do this sort of thing, I don't know what is. So, you know, if you are part of an industry, think about how you can mobilize and organize uh, with others in your industry. So one of the tools that comes out of labor struggles is occupying to shut down a workplace. These are miners in the Ukraine who are forbidden from going on strike. So what they're doing in this photo is they're holding a protest, but where are they holding the protest? In the mine, where they, the machines are shut down so that they can have their protests. Do you know how long they held this protest for? 30 plus days. This tactic was also used by Solidarity in Poland in the 1980s. Instead of leaving their factories, they occupied their factories. And this meant that uh, alternate workers couldn't be hired by the bosses, or in this case, the Communist Party, to replace them and um, you know, dis dis dissolve that economic leverage the workers had seized by going on strike. There may be a variation that works for you. And, uh, you know, general strikes. So if a Trump loses and refuses to leave and is actually trying to pull a coup uh, in this country, a general strike is an actual very reasonable tactic to call for. This is when no work happens, no shopping happens, students don't go to school, uh, faith leaders don't go to church. We all stop whatever we're doing until he uh, stops pulling a coup attempt. In order for this to work, we have to be part of reaching out and mobilizing for this. It's not just something that we can let sit on social media. We need to talk to our friends and our neighbors. We need to talk to our coworkers. We need to talk to our grocery store clerks and our grocery store owners um, to say, you need to shut down. What's going on is not okay. We're not going to have a democracy if we don't stop everything to demand that we actually have one. So lastly, I wanna talk briefly about if you're going to do in-person demonstrations, there are ways to design your demonstration so that non-violent discipline is upheld. This is a um, demonstration that myself and colleagues held in our local town. This is on our plaza during a farmer's market, uh, which is going on. And um, we're wearing black for mourning and we have red paint on our hands to symbolize that we have blood in our hands as being complicit in arms sales during an Israeli uh, bombing campaign against Gaza. So this was very controversial uh, in our area and people were very upset with us about it. And people called the police on us. They threatened to do violence to us. They got in our faces and yelled at us. And I had one member of this group who said, I'm not going to uh, commit to nonviolence. If they get in my face, I'm gonna punch them. And I had to decide right there, would I kick this person out of the demonstration? Or what, could I do something else? And what I came up with was we were going to process around the plaza slowly. And at every corner, we were going to stop and slowly raise our hands up and then slowly lower our hands down. What we needed was someone to keep tempo. So I handed this person the drum and the, the, the mallet. I said, please, can you keep a tempo? Boom, boom boom, all the way around the plaza. And what this did was this meant that this person couldn't throw punches because this person was essential for keeping the quality of our demonstration strong and powerful. Uh, they were responsible for keeping us all together as we went around the plaza. And another thing we did to maintain discipline, because we hadn't met together to train, to talk about talking points, is we did this in silence. We decided that rather than trying to argue with our hecklers, we would let our silence, our signs, and this giant banner speak for themselves. 
And you know what? These tactics meant that our demonstration was powerful, effective, nonviolent. None of us got arrested. Nobody got punched. And those who wanted to heckle us couldn't get into an argument with us because we refused to argue back with them. If you're going to do in-person demonstrations, really try to uh, design discipline into them. If you need some help thinking through the who, what, where, when, why of how to take action, our friends at Beautiful Trouble have made this amazing resistance hotline. And again, you can also join us for nonviolent action labs on Thursday nights in November. So to summarize and conclude a little bit, there are 10 things I want you to remember about protecting elect the elections. First of all, go vote and help get out the vote. Defend everyone's right to vote. Look into the election defenders, sign up for one of their trainings, be a part of being at the polls to de-escalate any intimidation on election day. Tell everyone again and again and again and again that counting those votes will take time, but every minute of that time is worth it. We want to anchor in democracy, not in partisan politics, not in this candidate versus that candidate, even though we're only concerned about one candidate really pulling a coup attempt. We want to remember that it's not just about getting rid of this person. It's actually about upholding our democracy, upholding our elections. So another point to remember is that now is the time to talk to people. Now and keep going. Don't just stop. But um, yeah, don't wait. Talk to people now. Mobilize along your common identities. Think of yourself as a mom, as a, as a worker, as a member of a faith group, and organize along those lines. We want to use mass action to push those pillars to deny coups any support. We want to push influencers to take a stand, not just to take action individually, but look around and see who are the people who have huge followings, who if they said this is bogus, we shouldn't support this, uh, would actually sway millions of people. So these are maybe public figures, politicians, institutions, celebrities. Um, we can really amplify our impact by really trying to get some of those um, influencers to take a stand. Um, while holding visibility actions, protests and persuasion actions can be really powerful for raising awareness of what's going on and what needs to happen, that alone is not going to be enough to stop a coup attempt. We need to use acts of non-cooperation like boycotts and strikes to raise the cost and the stakes of um, supporting this election. I mean, I'm sorry, supporting this coup attempt. Um, we also want to raise the social cost or the social benefit of supporting the election results. So two hands. I hope this has been a really helpful um, summary of the many things that are going on. Um, there is a lot to think about, but Essentially, I want you to remember that it is possible to counter this scenario, that planning now can be really helpful to pulling it off, that there's a lot of groups already organizing for every step of this process, and there are ways to plug into all of them. Um, and also that groups like Pachi, Benny, and others are here for you. We're here to help. So if you have questions or considerations, please get in touch. And until then, thank you for being concerned about the state of our nation and for being part of the growing number of people who are standing up to make sure that democracy matters and every vote is counted. Thank you.